This is the Voice of Early Childhood podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Voice of Early Childhood podcast. My name is Angelica Salinska. I'm your host and the founder of the Voice of Early Childhood. And today we are talking about telling hopeful stories of advocacy, agency and rights in early childhood education and care. So this is the first episode of 2024 and I wanted to make sure that we begin the year on the topic of advocacy to really take forward with us into the year and to really start making more and more of those kind of ripples of change, particularly after all of the kind of turmoil of uh, 2023 that you know, has been kind of brought into the sector. And of course, I'm here with two people who are specialists in this area, um, with the level, depth and like the amount of work that they put into researching, sharing this topic and basically advocating for the early childhood sector. So I'm really pleased to welcome Dr. Nathan Archer and Dr. Joe Albin Clark. So thank you very much both for coming onto the podcast. Thanks, Angelica. Um, it's great to be here. Yeah, it's lovely to be asked. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, so Joe is lecturer and researcher in early childhood and Nathan is researcher at Leeds Beckett University. And they'll talk a little bit more about their work throughout the podcast episode. But we'll get straight into it by talking about the need for advocacy in the early childhood sector. So from low status and pay that educators receive to that lack of awareness of the importance of play from outside the sector. It's really important to make sure that early childhood is understood and well advocated for. So Nathan, I know you've got lots of thoughts around this. So why don't you begin? Yeah, sure. It's, it's a big topic, but we really welcome the opportunity to, to explore it with you. Um, I guess to start with, it's important to kind of locate this idea of advocacy in, in the rich history that exists of, of advocacy and resistance within early childhood education, not just in England, but, but internationally as well. So if we think back to some of the key figures that, that we've perhaps all read about, you know, the Macmillan sisters and their work in Deptford and Bradford, Montessori's work in Rome, I'm thinking about the parents who literally built the centres in Reggio Emilia after the Second World War, Huge uh, figures uh, throughout history have kind of been involved in this kind of advocacy and activism work in the sector. And then, of course, there's been all kinds of movements and organisations and unions as well who've come together to advocate on, on issues in early childhood education. So, um, you know, there's the National uh, the Nursery Schools Association, we now know as Early Education. And I've been uh, reading a bit more about the early days of the Preschool Playgroups Association in the 60s and 70s, we're now known as, as the Early Years Alliance. And um, so I think, first of all, important to just recognise that, that that work is, 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 um, has been ongoing for, for, for many, many dec decades. But what strikes me is that um, many of the issues that those individuals and organisations that have been advocating about and for and on behalf of, of others, that those issues are, are still of concern to the sector. So you mentioned at, at, the, at the beginning there around the, the workforce conditions, thinking about paying conditions, but also maybe about funding for provision, equity of access for children and, and, and children's entitlements and rights to play. Those, those issues are still at the fore of our conversations and our work in, in advocacy and activism, I think, in the sector. So um, those issues don't go away. And, and, you know, we still need to continue, I think, to, to raise our voices on uh, with and on behalf of others uh, on, on those kind of issues. So that's what's in my mind um, at the beginning of the year, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's really important that you do go back to those pioneers, because actually we do need to reflect on what's been happening in the sector previously and look back at whether change has happened, how much has happened, and if things are kind of circling back around again, it's really vital to to look at how everything is kind of historically and um, culturally, socially situated, you know, mm -hmm. and it's not just kind of what's happening right now. So I guess the question is, what does advocacy look like today? for us? Well, that's that's a really good question and, and something that Nathan and I have pondering for a very long time. Uh, in a recent paper we've had published in the PRISM journal, um, there was a call for papers that asked us about social justice and what does it mean to be interested in social justice. So Nathan and I came together and we 
we wrote a paper that was about our concern that children's right to play is being something that's marginalised in lots of our early childhood education experiences. And um, through this paper, which was published in 2023 in Prism Journal, uh, we, we thought about these ideas of um, play diminishing and eroding in childhood experiences, not just in educational life, but in wider life. That was one of our concerns, childhood itself, really. And also thinking about why is it the case in educational contexts for young children that their play experiences seems to be at the margins. You know, why is it that teachers and educators feel that play is not something that's taken seriously? So we delved into lots of beautiful literature about why that was the case. We drew on work from Nicholson Wojcicki and Suto Manning and this idea that play has suddenly become something that's a privilege for young children rather than a right. Mm -hmm. So we returned to that United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, Article 31, the right to play, and we pondered that idea. You know, And in this paper, we explored two educators' experiences and told their stories and that that's something I'm sure we'll return to as we talk later on about the power of how we story those advocacies. You know, that the more we can amplify, um, for example, things like teachers bringing the right to play into their daily practice, then the stronger we can build that idea that advocacy is an everyday occurrence. It's not something necessarily big or showy. You know, it's something that can happen all the time, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. in, in day-to-day experiences. Um, so in that paper... We've we've we we wanted to tell educators stories, didn't we, Nathan? For yeah. Them. yeah. Absolutely. And as you say, Joe, kind of reflect those different scales of advocacy and activism as well. So as Joe said, the two examples in, in that paper were very much grounded in, in classroom practice in schools. You know, this was very much sort of small scale actions, but really rooted in principled pedagogical decision making um, as, as maybe an alternative uh narrative to some of the large-scale advocacy as important as that mm-hmm. is we just wanted to show those differences in scale as well and the doability of it i suppose mm-hmm. you know sometimes it, you can think as a sole teacher or educator or researcher you know whatever role we have in early child childhood that our role is small you know therefore we can't do much but what we found by in dialogue with the educators that we were researching was actually um, resistance practices, which is a term that we use in our written work, is is alive and well. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's already happening in day to day experiences, and in fact, in in something that Nathan and I are writing at the moment, that's yet that's yet to be published, is we're, we're thinking about. Oh, I don't know how correct to word this really, but how how it's sort of unseen almost. You know, mm-hmm. how 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 tiny it can be. And, um, Almost invisible and kind yeah, of micro. Yeah. It's already happening, really. I think is the mm-hmm. message. <laughs> you know, it's it, these things. Advocacy and activism is already there. You know, mm-hmm. it's already there. And I think becoming aware of it and telling the story of it and showing the stories of it is where the potential for advocacy is. I think in the line of scholarship that Nathan and I have been engaging in recently. Definitely, there's real power in bringing it into the light, isn't there? In kind of connecting these these um, smaller scale uh, acts of advocacy, definitely. Mm -hmm. And you talk about you know um, scholarly research, and you are both in academia. And what I always reflect on and talk to the sector um, about, and my students as well um, at university, is that importance of bridging the gap between academia and practice and also theory and practice and I guess that's exactly what you're doing here by working with educators working in classrooms and taking those snippets of practice and case studies and making them kind of bringing them to the forefront and bringing them to life and making sure that they do form that kind of part of practice and academia as and it's as as important as you know the academic kind of research it all comes together Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's that's a really interesting way of thinking about it. You know, bringing together of theory and practice. I think a lot of the work that I try to do in my role as a, a university educator is to demystify some of those research processes, and also not to be frightened of theoretical ideas. Mm-hmm. You know, and we talked a little a bit before about the history of early childhood. You know, and sometimes we see these great 
um, pioneers of early childhood, for example, um, Nathan mentioned before Montessori, and um, Froebel, for example, the philosophy of Reggio Emilia. You know, sometimes we're quite a bit reverential about those things. I think they're almost untouchable. But another piece of work that Nathan and I are doing is this idea of, of troubling those pioneer those pioneering theorists, mm-hmm. you know, and, and bringing them into the modern day to see how mm-hmm. they are refigured and remade in everyday contemporary practice. So mm-hmm. I, I think a big message for me anyway is don't be scared, you know, mm-hmm. don't, don't be scared of theory. Don't be scared of the big words, you know, because those big words are meant to be taken off and wrangled a little bit and kicked into touch, you know, and that, to think about the world of early childhood and the real things children do. It's just so many connections if you start to think mm-hmm. about it, you know. I'm, yeah, I'm so glad that you mentioned yeah. that. Yeah. Because it's it's so important to be able to critique even those kind of big pioneers and that is again what I always say to my students you know you're not just saying this pioneer believed this and and you know so and so agreed with them you know when they're writing their essays actually say well today this practice may not work because x y and z you know and actually thinking about if um, Montessori for instance was alive today what would she do you know how would her practice look like how would she advocate what how would she develop her theories so it's always thinking about you know the past but bringing it into today's context and not just kind of leaving it there as theory yeah and I just pick, sorry go on Joe no and I know what Nathan's going to say now so go on Nathan. <laughs> no, no, no 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 I interrupted you go for it <laughs> well only to say that um to, the talk of theory is not like a dirty thing you know, I, th- I think lots of students feel fearful of it. You know, mm-hmm. I think it's something you just do when you're writing your assignments and that's what you do to pass. You know, that mm-hmm. I think there's something here about almost falling in love with the ideas and the provocations that theory can bring. So, for example, something I do, I spend a lot of time in my university work is is trying to find ways to bring people into theory in non-threatening ways. So an example of that is a research network I'm involved with at Ed Chill, which is called the Child Agency and Rights Research Network. And in that, in that endeavour, we're really interested in finding ways to have reading groups where we come together and look at chapters of books together with the authors often. For example, this week we had Professor Alison Clark talking about slow knowledge, you know, mm-hmm. and reading with her and alongside her with, with undergraduates. And pe- in fact, we have people from all around the world come and join us for that session. Um, so, and we've got Guy Robert Holmes coming along in, in spring and Peter Moss, Professor Peter Moss coming later on. And that's open to anybody who wants to join. You know, it's not closed to a particular group. It's an open invitation. And, and something Nathan and I are interested in is any sort of research work that we do as a scholarly piece. It's like taking it and finding ways to make that bite size and then um, mm-hmm. delicious to others I suppose mm-hmm. you know I'm podcasting and making short films about things I'm writing blogs I'm writing articles they're all they're all accessible ways in to some of this more dense thinking and the, the more we can do that as academics I think you know the more that we can do that as opening doors I don't want to close the door I want to open the door mm-hmm. <laughs> you know I want to say come on in you know there's some really good stuff here think you know I want your lovely brain let's think together the more we can do that, I think, is is really powerful. It, it builds our agency and autonomy as um, professional people working in early childhood. And it's an amazing field. Mm-hmm. You know, why not think about it deeply? And I guess it really builds that platform up for advocacy and that activism, doesn't it? Mm. And like you say, builds up that confidence. And it's all about those shared, I always talk about shared reflections and that shared dialogue. And that's what then allows you to come up with new knowledge and solidify knowledge um, and again, also you mentioned um, kind of other people involved and really looking at modern day pioneers, I guess, as well. Mm-hmm. You know, people who are pioneering practice and, and in, in academia and, think, you know, pioneering thinking and extending the work of those kind of big pioneers that we already know about. That's important well, to really understand as well and kind of look at. pioneer is interesting, isn't it? I mean, that, that's yeah. something that we, we've been troubling, actually, in, in mm-hmm. a special issue that we're involved in that's coming out next year with Jane Abguz and Sid Mahandas. We're looking at the, oh. the word pioneer mm-hmm. and thinking about um, bewildering the pioneer. So meaning that um, looking sideways at it, you know, thinking about pioneers and reconfiguring the pioneers. Because if you think about the word pioneer, it sort of means going off into the wilderness, doesn't it? You know, I'm mm. bringing something into the wilderness. And we're sort yeah. of trouble that idea, 
you know. But I'm, I'm glad you, to hear you say, Angelica, about current things, you know, what current things mm-hmm. are going on, what are people doing now. But the, the, pioneer, the word pioneer can be quite a – I mean, I, it's my fault because I said it right at the beginning of the session. <laughs> but I said the word. But I think it's a really interesting word, you know, to, to think with. And that's yes. a nice example, isn't it, of, of thinking together about the language that we use all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, and why do we use these words? And are there other ways of thinking about those words? But now I'm already guessing what Nathan was going to say earlier. Go on, Nathan. <laughs> No, I don't know if I'm kind of looping back a bit, really, because this has gone <laughs> a really interesting direction. But I was thinking about your point, Angelica, about um, working with students and criticality. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things that really struck me in the study that I was involved in with, with the advocates and activists in the field was that they had this kind of critical awareness around policy. And that that kind of equipped them with the confidence to challenge and that challenge took lots of different forms. So it, sometimes it was that very sort of public advocacy work, or sometimes it was mm-hmm. more like the, the example that, that Joe's spoken about in that paper where it was kind of quite classroom-based. But but that criticality was a really, really um, important bedrock, really, as a starting point for advocating for and with and on behalf of, of children and families really um, and I'm interested to understand whether early educators see themselves as, as advocates or activists mm-hmm. and the extent to which they do uh, whether that forms part of their kind of professional language and their thinking and the extent to which that's the case or not so there's more work to do there for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. It just all ties into, again, kind of going back to the first thing I said in terms of the kind of professionalism of the sector and the respect that the sector is given um, mm. and that practitioner confidence that really then allows them to feel like they are advocates or agents of change and experts in what they do. Mm. Yeah, for sure. And, and and some of that, I think, is maybe about those kind of structural conditions. So we talked at the beginning about the, the workforce conditions, you know, pay and and um, the lack of value that's given to the sector, workload, etc. There's huge, huge challenges, and um, and so there's huge work to be done about about those structural issues. And this is where I mm-hmm. think maybe those professional associations, those collectives, and the importance of collectivising can can really help. And and maybe that's something we can talk a little bit more about in terms of uh, strengthening numbers. Mm. Yeah, I guess collectivizing is something that I am kind of really thinking a lot about right now. And in the last few months, really kind of people coming together to advocate together, because like you say, you know, there is strength in numbers. Um, and it's also about having that dialogue, even with the people that we may not agree with. So like those decision makers, um, mm-hmm. you know, that well, Department for Education, Ofsted and, you know, other people and even in schools, you know, the head teachers who may not necessarily have that early years background. So it's not necessarily always about advocating and having the activism, you know, kind of feeling as if you're against them all the time, but trying to Ooh. work together, communicate, collaborate. I think that's really important and shouldn't be lost amongst kind of all of these debates. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. If we think about work of the Early Education and Child Care Coalition at the moment, the Early Years Coalition behind Birth to Five Matters, this was really positive, proactive dialogue with mm-hmm. with policymakers and uh, and officials. Um, and, and I think there's there's much more work to do in that kind of arena, really. But I'm also interested in what might be the barriers for the sector kind of engaging in that collectivising. And, you know, people are... Um, People are tired, aren't they? You know, if we think about the work on on the back of the pandemic and um, just the kind of, as I say, the terms and conditions at the moment, the recruitment challenges, that's clearly a barrier to kind of collectivising. But, yeah, I'm interested in in, in what the international picture on that looks like as well. So I'm doing a little bit of work at the moment with some colleagues um, in Chile around their professional associations. And I think there's much more work that we can do in the UK to kind of galvanise the early childhood community um, into professional associations. And and, and maybe that's the strength in numbers that that can help that that positive dialogue that you talk about. Can, Can I bring a bucket of cold water? (laughs) <laughs> of course because <laughs> we're, we're, we're talking um almost as if it's it, it's easy to do this mm, and it's really yeah, not. i thought you might say that yeah, yeah, yeah. So many challenges. I, I mm-hmm. that 
there's real risks, I think, for, for lone teachers and educators and practitioners in feeling they can voice and, and make their own way through what is often quite a prescriptive and technicist approach. Mm. You know, almost sometimes it feels like there's no other way. There's only one story. Nathan and I draw on this idea of the one story of learning that in the paper that we've just had published and this idea of trying to find out uh, other stories and the importance of other stories of learning. But I think going back to that one story of learning, which um, curricular policy might have us believe, um, I think if you're out there, if you're a reception teacher in a school and you've not got a nursery teacher working along with you, quite a small preschool setting, you know, if, if you're um, a nursery school with not many staff, I think it's really hard to feel like you can find your own way through things so mm. i think there's something here in advocacy about the risks involved in advocacy and, and and how it's emotionally something that takes some bravery mm-hmm. and, and what i'm interested in is is how actually it's already going on you know so i think sometimes it's not the case that we have to do something different in order to advocate for young children i think it's about recognizing what you already do in your practice that advocates, you know, and is a form of activism. It can happen in really small ways, you know, and it can happen in the way that you interpret things. Something I say always to my students is, it's not, when you come to pieces of policy, it's not necessarily about feeling that you have to do what they say. Remember that you have a role in interpreting them, you know, and you interpret them um, with lots of thinking about, the ways in which young children learn um, and the ways that you feel ethically and morally are about what pedagogy needs to happen with that particular age and stage of child. So um, there, there are risks bound up with advocacy, but then again, it's also recognising what you already do in practice that we might badge as advocacy, but you might not see it as that. You know, so, so every time you enable a child to make a decision for themselves, every time you listen carefully and respectfully to a child, even every time you greet them warmly when they come through the door, you know, th- those tiny little things are actually acts of advocacy and activism already happening that feel quite risk free. You know, so mm-hmm. I think when we're thinking about it, we need to think about those lone people out there who feel quite embattled and making them feel okay about the things that they're doing and acknowledge the risks that sometimes there is in voicing some of these concerns about some of these prescriptive and more technicist approaches that we see sort of hiding in the discourses of policy that we have to contend with. Mm, I like that, Joe. I like that idea of, of, of naming those small acts. There's power yeah. in naming that as advocacy, definitely. Mm, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Just a more expansive view, you know. Sometimes I feel that you feel, oh, that's not for me. I don't want to do anything dodgy, you know. Oh no, mm-hmm. oh, no, I, I don't want to do anything that's like that, you know. But actually, it's recognizing it, that it's probably happening all the time, you know. Mm-hmm. And then um, the name, yeah, I hadn't thought of that before, Nathan. That that, that naming, mm-hmm. that's that acknowledgement, isn't it? Really, that in that critical mm-hmm. reflectivity. That what what's the name you you the term you use, Nathan? I forgot now. The kind of critical awareness. Yeah, critical awareness. I think that's a really helpful phrase to, to bring. Makes me think about your your term of turning to notice as well. It is yeah. that noticing, isn't it? And that sense of like acknowledging that this is an act of advocacy in, in this moment and there is power in that. Yeah, yeah. it's already happening. Mm. I think, it, you know, if you look... <laughs> You know, yeah. if, you, if you look yeah. hard enough and, and give yourself the permission to look and to think about it. And that's all about building this sense of autonomy and agency, which is what you can hear. You can hear what we're thinking about for our next piece of writing here. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that's, that's sort of where we're moving in the direction of. I uh, just a very quick and a very exciting announcement from me. The Voice of Early Childhood Conference is back. After the success of our first one, we have organised another one on the 16th of March, 2024. This will be a day full of learning, sparking reflections, sharing, discussing and networking. Our overarching theme, which fits perfectly with the ethos of the Voice of Early Childhood, is advocacy, agency and change. 
So we have Dr. Nathan Archer as one of our speakers kicking off the conference with his keynote all around advocacy and activism in early childhood, followed by the rest of our brilliant speakers on the day who are Adam Marich, who will be discussing leading your team through offset inspections, Dr. Stella Louie, talking about school readiness and intellectual readiness, a question of balance, Ben Kingston Hughes, exploring the power of play, Dr. Valerie Daniel, creative pedagogical practices to encourage agency, Ruth Swales, unpicking how do we construct our own curriculum, Helen Bately, talking about the foundations of early writing, and a special feature from Dr. Sue Allenham, Dr. Sue's surgery, which you can book into throughout the day. This is an opportunity for a one-to-one -one Q&A session with Dr. Sue, so really make the most of this special feature by coming prepared with your burning questions, whether this may be around practice, leadership, Ofsted perhaps, or anything else you can think of, you can ask Dr. Sue. We also have a whole conference discussion which is focused on sustainability in early childhood in the widest sense. So we'll be focusing on sustainable development goals, which we will discuss, debate and really unpick what this means for early childhood and our responsibility as educators within this. Linked to this, there will be a student posters showcase around the sustainable development goals where we can engage in more discussion and reflections, really focusing on linking theory and academia to practice. So there's lots of in store for you on this really exciting day. And as always, you can expect on our conference day opportunities for shared reflection, discussion and healthy debate, valuable CPD, a diverse range of speakers, a safe space to share your practice and thoughts, a relaxed atmosphere, plenty of opportunities for networking, a selection of exhibitor stands to explore and ask questions and, of course, fantastic food and refreshments, as always. And for 2024, we really had to step it up a notch with a choice of workshops, so a leadership or a practice strand to choose from, a start of the day and an end of the day keynote, interactive sessions, and of course, our Q&A with Dr. Sue, which is new. So if this sounds like the kind of conference and early childhood community that you would like to be part of, then grab your tickets before they sell out. We do have limited capacity. And if you haven't already heard, you can get 10% off to use at checkout by signing up to our newsletter. I've added the link in this episode description where you can sign up for your code, find more info about the conference and speakers and access our Eventbrite page to secure your ticket. So I will see you in March. And I guess that's where kind of going back to case studies from practice and you also talk about kind of storytelling and story sharing. That's when that really comes in so that educators, if they don't kind of notice what they're already doing and haven't got that awareness that they are advocating, examples from other people and practice actually show that, you know, this is this is also advocacy and they can relate. And it's all about that kind of relational pedagogy, isn't it? That really ha makes change happen rather than just you know, re reading something that you may think, well, actually, this doesn't really apply to me. Like you said, you know, this advocacy, I don't really feel comfortable with it. Yeah, yeah. That, I think the, the idea of stories are very powerful little bundles of things. You know, when, when we story our day-to-day -day experience of thinking about young children or working with young children, and we, we, we tell that story to ourselves and also we, we share that story Um Something powerful goes on there. It's almost a narration of yourself, you're narrating your own experience and, and looking out in, you know, you're looking from the outside in at what you do. So, yeah, story making, storytelling, story sharing about day to day practice is something really powerful that we can all do. Mm -hmm. I think what I like about that idea of story sharing that you talk about, Joe, is is as you allude to, Angelica, it connects people. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's something mutual and reciprocal in saying, "Yeah, I feel like that too," or "This is how I kind of deal with this situation." There's a um, there's a solidarity, I think, that is gained in that sharing process, and yeah. a creativity as well. I, I think there's something about 
the people who are drawn to work with young children that I think is really special. You know, there's there's something about being with 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 little ones that really makes you become quite a get in touch with a creative part of yourself. You know, because there's so much pretend, there's so much play in it, there's so much imagination in it that it's almost tapping into that part of yourself. So probably, if you're working with young children, you're already a creative person, you're already a playful person. You know, so you've already got that capacity. You know, to to share and story. There's um, some of the work I'm involved in is a, is a bag lady storytelling collective, and we draw on the work of Ursula Le Guin. And Ursula Le Guin um, is a science fiction writer. She, she's dead now. But she, she talks about that, that stories are powerful little bundles. You know, she uses the term medicine bundles, you know, the idea that we put things into our bag of our mixed experiences and we make new stories. And when we tell those stories, they sort of fly off on the wind you know, and generate new stories and pollinate mm. new things. So the, there's something really special about stories. And I think we know that as with young children because we know how powerful it is to tell a story with them. You know, mm. when you can eyeball a little one, you know, and you've got the retention mm. and, and, and even better when you make up a story together, you know, yeah. and you use props to do it. Something quite magical happens, I think, in those moments. So telling stories, sharing stories, um, it's good stuff. Mm, the power of storytelling even for adults and not just children Ooh. yeah for sure mm. Mm. so i'm just thinking we've kind of discussed a lot of things in terms of um i guess some of the, like the bigger picture and the work that you're doing and kind of research in academia and some snippets of what practitioners you know maybe i guess doing are doing already but what about those kind of practical examples? Like what does advocacy actually look like in practice in terms of, you know, if someone wants to kind of think, OK, I must already be advocating, but I'm not quite sure what it is that I'm doing that is advocacy. So can we like name a few things, a few more? I know we've kind of had snippets here and there of a active advocacy and I guess activism as well. Yeah, should we draw one of those examples from the paper? Yeah, yeah, I think that would be absolutely perfect. Go on, Nathan, you go first. Well, well, the, the example I wanted to share was um, from a piece of research that I also undertook about three or four years ago. And one of the participants was uh, uh, an early career teacher working in a reception year um, in a school in the south of England. And interestingly, uh, she was a real advocate of uh, loose parts play in the outdoor environment. So she brought in all the tires and the planks and the crates and, and, and kind of facilitated um, this really wonderful playful environment with all of the affordances that um loose parts play brings but unfortunately um the the, the sort of management in the school were not approving at all of this particular um approach to outdoor learning and um some of the the feedback she got was that the the outdoor environment was untidy and that it wasn't mm -hmm. necessarily zoned in the way that um the leadership thought that um it should be and this particular teacher kind of pushed back on that um, and insisted that these uh, loose parts play and everything that, that kind of came with that um, should remain and, and really stood her ground. It was something she felt really, really sort of uh, powerfully about. And, and I always think about a phrase by Lynette Morris when she talks about ethical subversions. Beautiful. You know, and for me, this was just a, such a great example of this pedagogical decision making and action that was a an ethical subversion. And although that might seem like um, a, a fairly small scale example, for me, that was a perfect example of advocacy in action at, at a sort of school level. So um, I was pleased to be able to report afterwards that she managed to talk the, the powers that be into retaining the loose parts play in children and continued to, to learn. And, and, and play with them in that environment so a success story I think mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and my example as well it fits beautifully in with Nathan's this is why we chose these two examples for the paper because interestingly they both took place outdoors so in, in my example it was Michelle who's a nursery teacher with three and four year olds and then um, she she had the literacy coordinator from further up the school come in and say what does your handwriting look like now, for, for somebody working with three and four year olds, that, that's quite an interesting question, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What does handwriting look like with three and four year olds? So she said, I'll show you what handwriting looks like with three and four year olds. And what she did was she pulled out of the bag, which is the wonderful thing about people working with young children. They've got 
tips you know they've always got things they can pull out it's a story of the children playing outside with a piece of lycra fabric so like big stretchy lycra she had it wrapped mm-hmm. over the, top of the tree um a tree branch and the children were swinging on this lycra outsource so so she said to the literacy coordinator there's handwriting you know <laughs> look at look at that gross motor play um look at that um look at all that thought and imagination that went into that look at that communication look at that physical and emotional dexterity that's going on and she drew attention of course to that very holistic experience that the children are having outdoors and she she articulated literacy through that hanging and swinging on a piece of lycra Mm -hmm. in outdoor play you know and I think that lovely example was somebody who's confident enough to say this is what that looks like here you know Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. there's there's something powerful there, I think, about, first of all, observing children and their day-to-day playful experiencing, finding a way for them to access their entitlement to play, not just in the UN Convention, but, of course, in the Mm -hmm. EYFS as well. We talk about children's entitlement to child-initiated experiences and her showing that and using an example of it. Because, of course, what she could have done is, is just said to that literacy coordinator, oh, come on, this is children have been map making over here. You know, but she didn't. You know, she, she was much more expansive in her understanding. And then um, for, for me, that, that that was just a wonderful example to think with. So mm-hmm. in the paper, in the PRISM article, Nathan and I used both of those examples to think with about how that's enabling children's right to play with the UN Convention. But also it's about uh, those educators being able to articulate the central importance of play um, in young children's experiences on the, in their day to day practice. Mm-hmm. There's so much there to unpick, isn't there, in terms of advocacy mm. and agency and rights, mm. you know, like you say, in terms of understanding children's rights and understanding children's development and um, kind of the early years in general and play. Um, and I like that you said, you know, it's that confidence that the practitioner had to be able to share that and articulate it. But I think it's also, and the same with your example, Nathan, it's about um, you know, that pedagogical decision making and that ethical subversion needs to come from being grounded in knowledge, understanding of child development and theory as well. Actually, you know, when you talk about loose parts, you need to understand why are loose parts important? You know, what do they give the children? Maybe a bit of theory behind that as well. So it, it's all coupled with knowledge and confidence, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, I would agree. Yeah. A spot I guess, on. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's the 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 recipe for um, advocacy, probably <laughs> in yeah. early years. Yeah, um, maybe. But it's just yeah. getting there, isn't it? It's it's ensuring that our educators do have that grounding in child development, in theory, in that knowledge, and and also then they do feel confident enough to be able mm-hmm. to articulate all of this, and they know that you know because they have this knowledge and they have this experience with children that it is of value and they are advocates and they are experts in what they do and it's kind of not knowing it acknowledging it and then being able to think okay what can I do with this information absolutely yeah Yeah. Yeah. and just to um I'm just thinking about who that articulation happens to you know not, Mm -hmm. not just um visitors to the school you know, not just inspectors, but also to the school community themselves, you know, to to our colleagues, to the people we work alongside, but also to our families and parents and children themselves, you know, to to celebrate those moments with them, to share those moments with them. That's why practices such as observation and pedagogical documentation and pedagogical narration and watching videos with children and looking at photographs with children are so very powerful things. And some of our greatest advocates are parents and children themselves. Yeah. You know, uh, and, and I think we, we there's a lot to be done there with 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 recognizing and celebrating play alongside colleagues and families and children. Mm-hmm. A ground movement, if you like. You know, not thinking yeah. after everybody else that comes through the door, but actually w- working together with the communities within practice to to have mm-hmm. that conversation and to celebrate it when it happens. And I'm. Um- Actually, really interesting that you mentioned that because that reminds me of the reason why I called the voice of early childhood the voice of early childhood and not early years or the early childhood sector. Kind of, I had that sectoral profession in mind, um, or like EYFS or anything around that kind of wording. 
but it's about early childhood in the broadest sense, you know, not just in terms of children being in settings, but actually in terms of children being in society, you know, in their families, in the wider world and what that means and really advocating for that and giving kind of the, I guess, the early childhood community and the early childhood part of children's lives a voice and that kind of respect and the rights that they deserve in that kind of part of their lives. Yeah. And obviously then involves families and parents very much, so, you know, carers. Yeah, it's much broader than our educational experiences, isn't it? And that's what you're saying. It's Mm -hmm. it's a bigger story to be told. And that was another one of the drivers, I think, for this paper, was we were worried about the erosion of play, you know, a bigger story about why it's something that we know through international literature is so fundamental to young children's early experiences and their growth and their development and, and all those holistic capacities which we know um, you know, why is it something that's diminishing and eroding? You know, mm. and can we bring it, can we illuminate that as a as a matter of social justice? So mm. that, that's how we think within that paper. Mm-hmm. Like you say, it's so much bigger, isn't it? It's not mm. just uh, education and care. Play is also kind of diminishing in society in terms of, you know, all of the kind of the safety aspects and lack of outdoor space as well, if we think about outdoor play. Yeah. And Nathan was mentioning before about those international examples. I think we we so we sometimes think early childhood is all about what's happening in England, mm. but there's there's times that there's a look on a bigger stage about mm. what what's what's understood by childhood right across the world, and it's contextual to some of those socio cultural manifestations, you know. And um, and there's lots of reasons for that. I don't think we can just say plays eroding because of X and Y. It's quite a complicated picture, you know, mm-hmm. and it's thinking about, I think shedding light on the significance of play is something I always want to do, you know, and, and children's entitlement to it mm-hmm. as, as part of the UN Convention, but also part of curriculum contexts. I'm always interested in, in that sort of conversation. And also, I'm always interested in how educators form identities of themselves. And, that, and that's, I think, something that Nathan and I have always returned to in our thinking together is, um, you know, how, how can we amplify? That's a word you use, isn't it, Nathan? Amplify, that's mm-hmm. right. Yeah. yeah. I think it goes back to that idea of stories, doesn't it? And I think mm-hmm. um, Kathy Nutt Brown and Peter Clough t- talk about um, turning up the volume on unheard voices, which is a, mm-hmm. a phrase I love. love that. Yeah, yeah. It, really, it really drives the work that I do, if I'm honest, and, and, and the work that interests me around the workforce. Yeah. Um, so if I can play a small part in that, then that's all good with me and continue to work with, with, with Joe on that, that kind of um, vein of research as well. So much bigger conversations going on here, isn't there? We're, we're talking about democracy. Yeah. <laughs> we're talking about citizenship. You know, we're talking about what does it mean to be a child, you know, and also what do we understand to mean by a child, you know, mm-hmm. um, I've got um, an MA student at the moment and she's thinking about communicating play with her parents and children. And she said to me something like, I want to think of these children as citizens. I thought, wow. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's, a stopping point, isn't it? I think my job here is done, you know. (laughs) Fine, (laughs) off you go. You know, it, it was just a wonderful thing that she said. And uh, but it's that recognition of a child not just as a becoming adult or becoming a, mm-hmm. a primary school age child or becoming a secondary school. Age. I mean, echo some of the work in Alison Clark stuff about slowing down. You mm-hmm. know, we're always in a rush to get to the next stage, and then um, these bigger questions ask us: Well, why have we got this notion of hurriedness? And this notion of hurriedness pushes um, ideas of play to the because it's not taken seriously. You know. Mm-hmm. So it's it's bringing those themes back in and, and taking them seriously, which is a lot of the driver of the sort of scholarship that I do. And I, I think Nathan does as well. And when you mention children as citizens, actually, that reminds me of sustainability and the wider picture and sustainable mm-hmm. development goals as well, doesn't it? In terms of really understanding that, actually, that word sustainability, we often see as like eco practice and recycling and mm-hmm. reusing. And that's something that I'm trying to really work on more as well actually and that's why I kind of added a snippet of it into my conference 
but looking at really making sure that it is situated in everything that we do and it's not just here's a a seminar on sustainability or here's a conference that's separate on sustainability actually it's everything you know that we do we all have that responsibility for the sustainable development goals and they mean so much more than the kind of the day-to-day tasks of what we normally kind of see as common practice in terms of you know the environment is so much bigger than that Mm. yeah I think we're, we're, everything we read is about how we've reached a tipping point, isn't it, with the climate? You know, we're, we're sort of going beyond the point now where we can not take it seriously. We have to take it seriously. You know, there's a term, Anthropocene, you know, meaning that the idea that the world we live in now has been so shaped by human activity, it's changed its form, it's changed mm-hmm. its, its weather systems, it's changed its geology, you know. And I think that our young children coming through now will inherit a world very different from the one that mm-hmm. that you or I have inherited. And the, there's it's an urgency to this work now. Isn't it? it can't be just be an add-on or a bolt-on or something mm-hmm. nice that we do now and again. We, we, we can't help but do it now, you know. So yeah. I'm glad you, you, you mentioned those things. It's so important. But I think more so than just kind of like the physical environment and the world, it's it's about society you know citizens like you mentioned and quality education and I guess it brings in advocacy in terms of you know eradicating poverty and things like that like what what part do we play in all of that and actually ensuring that educators understand that they do play a really big part because actually they are educating the future citizens who will be carrying on you know with all of these issues that we're facing now and who will be left you know to kind of to deal with all these issues as well Mm. And that makes me think about the earlier part of the conversation where we were talking about connectedness as well and mm-hmm. the importance of that story sharing and connecting up and collectivising where, where it's appropriate as well, really. We can only sort of push this forward together, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I think on that topic of collectedness again, and maybe this is the last thing that we kind of mentioned because you know, it's been a long conversation already and we've dipped into so many parts, but um, just thinking about again turning up the volume of unheard voices that you know you mentioned I just love that so much um so I always think it's vital to not just work within the sector and kind of speak to each other and you know we're almost then preaching to the converted already actually it's about stepping outside of the early childhood sector and into the wider education sector and making sure that our voices of that represent early childhood are heard in spaces where they're not normally heard and seen and they're not present you know normally and maybe even stepping outside of education and kind of advocating for play and for childhood in wider society and what do you think about that in terms of activism and advocacy so it's a big big question I, I think we start with our own back door you know with with our own networks that we're working within and then particularly I think our students are very important in this movement, you know, mm-hmm. about helping them to have a sense of themselves as as being someone with something to say, you know, mm-hmm. and and not just their point of view, but children and families' point of view as well. So I think it starts in, in localised ways, in small ways, but also mm-hmm. recognising what goes on already. I don't think advocacy and activism is something you become tomorrow. I think it it is recognising what's already happening within Mm -hmm. your own practice and and maybe just sharing that thinking around, um, telling it to yourself, first of all, I think, you know, and and then talking to other people about what you do and celebrating the sector where we can. It's a really misunderstood sector, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, how many times I say to people who are working early childhood and they go, oh, that's Mm -hmm. cute. Mm-hmm. And I'm you play with children. <laughs> That's really all you do. It's, really, it's deadly serious stuff, you know. Yeah. So it's well to take it seriously. I think um, that, that that will help. Yeah, it's interesting to see some of the campaigns out there who maybe mm-hmm. focusing on brain development or children's mm-hmm. rights. Lots of different discourses, but um, in many ways equally powerful in 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 perhaps equipping us with some of the the language, the research, the tools mm-hmm. to articulate the power and the importance of this early phase of of human life, really. Um, And yet, as Joe said, I guess we all have a role to play, and that might just start with the work we do in our daily practice. 
but I would also advocate for linking up and connecting wherever possible, really. Mm. Yeah. And does that also include linking up and connecting with people who don't necessarily have the same views as us, who don't necessarily agree? Absolutely. Yeah. I think we're increasingly in a polarised society. Mm -hmm. You know, it it seems that there's not much coming together. There seems to be quite a lot of moving apart politically, I think, at the moment. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the more we're able to listen, I mean, listening is always at the heart of every good relationship, isn't it? Try to take mm-hmm. on board where people are up to in their thinking, and um, and and engage in where they're coming from in their viewpoints. I don't know if we can convert everyone to the cause, you know, but I, I think I think it starts with try. listening, listening mm-hmm. to opposing points of view to see where their orientation is, and then making decisions about what may be a good form of conversation at that point. You know, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's a hard one. I think that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, perhaps it goes back to that kind of critical awareness, mm. professional confidence, and then this idea of self-efficacy that that we can, mm. each of us, we can make a difference. And as Joe said, those skills of listening and engaging, but also having that belief in the importance of of, of this work, I think, is really key. Yeah, taking it seriously, I think, you mm. know, and encouraging practitioners out there in the field and educators who've moved beyond university to not be frightened of thinking of themselves as a learner. You know, it's, mm-hmm. we're all still learning, you know, and we can learn so much from listening to each other's thinking and sharing thinking together. That's a connectivity thing, I think, isn't it? We keep going back to it. Yeah. I think well, it's probably a good place to finish. Lifelong learning. <laughs> yeah. um, well, thank you both so much. It's been a fascinating conversation and we'll really give the early childhood community that kind of hope I guess for 2024 in terms of you know really knowing that they can make changes happen from the smallest of things that they do and practice already like you say you know it's already happening it's things that you do every day so it's just tapping into um, and reflecting on the practice that you already do I think that's probably the main message and then connectedness I think is just so so vital especially for 2024 after like I said at the beginning, all the turmoil of 2023, really kind of trying to look at things like I think with, um, you know, like you say, listening, but also looking at things with curiosity rather than judgment. And then I think that can be really reciprocated then from other people, mm-hmm. hopefully. <laughs> Definitely. Well, yeah. Keep, keep sharing hopeful stories. I would yeah. Say. Yeah. yeah. That's a lovely note to end on. Being hopeful. Mm-hmm. Yes, definitely. Um, So, yeah, thank you very much. And I'll just say to the listeners that you can find out more on the Voice of Early Childhood website, including the work that Joe and Nathan do. Um, And also, if you enjoyed listening to this episode, you might also like David Wright's episode, an article all around early childhood centres as places of influence, restoration and hope, which, again, is very much linked to this episode as well. Um, The link is in this episode description. Okay, well, thank you both once again very, very much. It's been a really enjoyable conversation for me and I'm sure all of the listeners will really enjoy this too. Thank you. Thank you.